Greetings, Squeaky fans! Michael here, and I play Pokemon a lot more than the average person, simply due to the fact that it's my job. In fact, I completed 12 Pokemon playthroughs in 2021, more than I've ever done in a year before, all of them here on YouTube, either on this channel or on m and TV Plays. One of my favorite things about Pokemon as a whole is how each playthrough can be made unique due to the virtually limitless options you have for a playthrough team. And since I played through Pokemon so many times this year, I got to use a large variety of teams. In this video, I'm gonna be going over every Pokemon team that I used this year, and in addition to summarizing basically what happened in the playthrough, I'll be giving them a rating of one to 10 out of 10. These ratings will be based on, well, really whatever I want, but I'll mainly be focusing on how good I thought the team was and how sentimentally attached I got to it. I'll be going over these teams in order of when the first video from that particular playthrough aired, since some of these run-throughs were split across multiple videos. So the first one is when I played through Ultra Moon without catching any Pokemon. This was the same premise as my very popular challenges with the same gimmick in Platinum and Heart Gold. Essentially, I cannot obtain any Pokemon by throwing a Pokeball at them. So only gift Pokemon or fossils or any other method that doesn't involve physically throwing a Pokemon in battle. This playthrough was good, but I could have done it better. A big thing I've learned this year is that the story of a playthrough is almost always most compelling if it's start to finish in one video. The only exception being a brand spanking new game. This playthrough was across three videos on plays and then a summary video here. And in retrospect, I should have done it as just one video on one of the two channels. As for the final team, I was surprised that I ended up with a pretty balanced team. The final squad was Fabio the Primarina, Hazmat the Totem Salazzle, Cray Cray the Cray Dilly, Mace the Totem Togemaru, Libre the Halucha, and Enigma the Umbreon. Plus Chipmunk the Totem Alolan Raticate was a member of the team for most of the playthrough, basically until right before the league. Unlike the other no-catching challenges, this was a team I really got to craft and select. The other no-catching challenges forced me into a specific team of six, maybe with a couple extras. But for the Ultra Moon one, I ended up with a bunch of different Pokemon by the end of it due to the large variety of ways to get Pokemon. Fabio was the starter. Mace, Hazmat, and Chipmunk were gift totems I got from collecting totem stickers. Cray Cray was from a fossil. Libre arrived at Pokepelago. And Enigma was the Eevee from the gift egg. And these were just the Pokemon that I actually used. There were lots of Pokemon that I didn't, like the other gift totems, the gift surfing Pikachu and Poi Pole, all the other fossils, I did use Archeops for a period of time, but Defeatist was so frustrating I benched it. And Pokepelago Pokemon that I didn't use, like I think I got a Comfey that I didn't use because it overlapped with Primarina, or the plenty of Pokepelago ones that showed up that didn't stay, or I just never got in the first place. I was not lucky with Pokepelago. In the end, I'm gonna give this team a seven out of 10. It's actually quite a strong team, being very type diverse as a result of all my options, and it would make a lot of sense as a no challenge playthrough team as well. I also got quite attached to certain team members, especially Fabio and Cray Cray. Cray Cray ended up being quite talented after evolving, and Fabio was the consistently amazing starter throughout the entire playthrough. He basically 1v1'd the Totem Araquan in battle, what would end up being the toughest totem battle of the playthrough, and him living a hit from Ultra Necrozma without affection is the only reason I won that battle first try. I can't give the team a perfect ranking though, mainly due to Libre and Enigma. While I'm quite fond of Halucha and Umbreon as Pokemon species, these specific ones were added late and didn't really meet my expectations. Despite Halucha having a high base speed stat, Libre would often fail to outspeed opponents that I needed it to. Enigma's bulk was useful, but its inability to hit back much at all was a bit frustrating at times. The next playthrough I did was one here on this channel. Can you beat Pokemon Platinum? And that's it. This playthrough was an April Fool's joke that I came up with like six months before April Fool's Day and was excited the whole time to actually make it. The joke is that it's framed like an extremely difficult, grueling playthrough challenge, when in reality, it's just a regular playthrough. This playthrough ended up being a pleasant surprise in more ways than one. The first surprise was that I wasn't really sure how it would perform before posting it, but it ended up being really popular, the second most viewed video on this channel that I posted this year. Additionally, during the playthrough, as I'm sure several of you remember, I found three full one in 8,000 odd shinies. Hello. 
Um, I got another shiny Graveler. And ended up catching two of them and using them on my team. It was incredible. I have not found any shiny Pokemon since where I wasn't playing a game where the odds were boosted for the purpose of that video. Any like normal odds shinies, I haven't found any. The final team was James the Empoleon, Ambush the Shiny Crobat, Tether the Tangrowth, Gallant the Gallade, Korg the Shiny Golem, and Devios the Weavile. Plus Kalahari the Gabite was a main member of the team before I ended up replacing it with Korg. This team is a nine out of 10. It's two full odds shinies and a well-balanced team of strong Pokemon. And it ended up defeating the league relatively easily. The only thing holding this team back from being a 10 out of 10 is that I lost to a vanilla playthrough gym leader for the first time in, God, I have no idea. The battle was against Candice, don't say it. And at the time, Devios was not yet on the team, meaning four of the five were weak to Frostlass's ice and ghost moves. I failed to notice this before letting James faint and Frostlass ended up sweeping me. I know that oversight was my fault, but it does mean that the team was unbalanced against ice. At least before adding Devios, which would have been on the team at the time of that gym battle if the platinum move sets for Sneasel and Weavile weren't weird and bad. Overall though, I think this team ended up pretty iconic, especially the full odds shinies Ambush and Korg. Korg specifically is pretty memorable because I caught it despite it knowing self-destruct. The next playthrough is one that spawned so much more than I ever could have predicted. Pokemon Emerald, but I'm Team Sky! The beginning of my own Pokemon Evil team. It's not the first one that I've come up with. There's Team Arrow and Team Pixie Dust. Some of you guys know that, but like this one is by far the most successful. For this, I played through the Hoenn region as the leader and sole member of the third villainous team in the Hoenn region that wants to use Rayquaza to expand the sky, whatever that means. On the topic of that, you only have a couple days left, if that, to get a Team Sky shirt or an MNJ TV hat, if they haven't sold out, at mnjtvmerch.com. Both of these are going away at the end of the year and the hat could sell out soon. So if you want one, mnjtvmerch.com. The final Team Sky team was Air Bud the Mighty Enna, Storm the Pelipper, Night Sky the Crobat, Catapult the Tropius, Intercept the Skarmory, and of course, Skydios the Rayquaza. Plus Windrunner the Swellow was the Pokemon Skydios took the spot of. 10 out of 10. It's obviously not as balanced as the previous two, but that's because it was the theme of the playthrough. And even with that lack of balance, it was a good team. I only lost one battle, my first attempt to beat Roxanne when my team was the weakest, and I got really attached to multiple members. Storm was instrumental for so many battles, and Air Bud being the only non-flying member made for a fun gag when people like Pokemon 7 complain about it being there. Air Bud. I'm not following anything going on, but the nickname is Fire. I'm gonna let it, I'm gonna let it go. Just go catch a Wingle, my man, catch a Wingle. I know it's not a flying type, but it's not a fire or ground or water type either, and Team Magma and Aqua use those. I personally liked having it there since it helped me beat Watson. And of course, actually getting Rayquaza and being the only Hoenn team leader to succeed was such a fun story to play out. This team is 10 out of 10, not because it's the strongest on paper, but because it started Team Sky, a fun piece of content lore of mine that's been really fun for me and I fully intend to continue. The next playthrough was Pokemon White, but I randomized everything. It was basically an extreme randomizer Nuzlocke, just not a Nuzlocke. I hate Nuzlocke's. I did use Nuzlocke in counter rules though, so as to not get an endless amount of random Pokemon, I'd spend forever trying to evolve into legendaries since evolutions were random. It was split up into two parts, but in retrospect, I think it would have been better as just one. My final team was Exoskull the bug type Sock, Biome the grass fighting Yuxi, Buzz Button the electric Lilligant, Armorous the dragon Latios, just dragon, so no psychic type. Count Burn, the Water Ghost Crocodile, and Tortellini, the Steel Blastoise. I unfortunately am only going to give this team a four out of 10. While it was type diverse, it wasn't as balanced as I would have preferred due to four of the six members only being single typed. Additionally, while there were some great moments, like me actually catching a wild Yuxi, I didn't end up super attached to the team. I had a fondness for Exoskull due to it being my starter, and Tortellini was a late addition that was quite strong due to entry hazards and shift gear, but the others didn't end up with much of an attachment or personality to me. I think a big reason I didn't end up super attached to the team is that the team changed a lot during the playthrough. There were Pokemon I was using as staples until 
they failed to learn a good stab move or they evolved into something that I already had or was worse or something like that. It's tough to get attached to a roster when that roster only ends up in its current form at the very, very end. It was definitely a fun playthrough though. It was my first extreme randomizer and I have learned that I enjoy doing them without the stress of a Nuzlocke being attached to it. Next was Pokemon Y as the first dark type gym leader. First, chronologically, I know Piers and Marnie exist now, but it was like, oh, but back in Kalos. So, chronologically. This video was a lot of fun. My first true monotype run since Mightyena was on the Team Sky team, and it pleasantly surprised me with its success, being my most successful video on plays until it was passed up in the fall. My final team was Frog the Greninja, Roughneck the Pangoro, A Photokiss the Malamar, Gario the Crocodile, Asriel the Mega Absol, and Pesticide the Skunk Tank. I also used Downfall the Yavaltal from when I caught it all the way up until right before the lead, since I didn't feel it would be super fair to use a legend in one of the easiest Pokemon leagues out there. I am giving this team an eight out of 10. Overall, I loved this team. Even though Y is a notoriously easy game, I was worried about some of the challenges I'd face with a monotype run. Despite that, this team kicked a lot of butt all throughout the run, which was a lot of fun. I got attached to most of the Pokemon and there were some great moments like Pesticide defeating Deantha's terrifying Mega Gardevoir right at the end. However, it's only getting an eight out of 10 due to Asriel the Absol. It rarely contributed to the team simply due to being a pure dark type a type that literally every other team member had. I used it to defeat Olympia, not because it was best suited to doing so, but because I felt obligated to have it appear in a major battle. The story of the video eventually has me send it away to go track down an Absolite, which it does. So I finally have a mega evolution, only for it to instantly get one shot in the first battle of the league and proceed to be completely useless for the rest of it. I will admit it made for a pretty entertaining moment, but overall, Asriel was dead weight on the team. The rest of the team I love though. The next playthrough was one here on this channel, Pokemon Emerald, but I used my original team. This is pretty straightforward. I played through Pokemon Emerald using the team I used in Emerald the first time I ever played it as a kid, but with my adult knowledge of good movesets and strategies. The team was Fen the Swampert, Lasso the Breloom, Galavagos the Torkoal, and Reset the Rayquaza. I'm giving it a seven out of 10. It of course has nostalgic value, plus I quite like all of the species of Pokemon I used. Swampert once again proved itself one of the best Pokemon to use in Hoenn, if not the best. I'm sorry, Sceptile, I love you, but Swampert is very good. And while Breloom and Torkoal are better in the newer gens, they're still a lot of fun to use. And to this day, I'm I'm still extremely pleased with myself for the Torkoal nickname of Galavagos. It was annoying when writing the script because spell check activated a lot, but still, it's very clever. What holds this team back from being a 10 out of 10 team is a few different things. First, it is of course incomplete, not having six team members. Swampert, Breloom, and Torkoal supplemented with three other Pokemon would have made for an excellent team, but they had some struggles at times due to there only being three of them. I did it that way because that's how I did it as a kid, but nowadays I know that having a full team of six makes a big difference. I lost my first gym battle against Juan, and while I did beat him second try with the exact same team, no training in between, if the team had been more fleshed out, I think I could have won that first try. Losing that battle is actually the second reason I docked some points from this rating. Rose my confidence a little bit. Hadn't lost a vanilla playthrough gym battle in who knows how long, and then I lost two of them in one year. And the final reason I can't give it full marks is reset the Rayquaza. I didn't use it extensively in the league, but I did lean on it at quite a few times, which felt uncomfortable due to how overpowered it is. I enjoyed that as a kid, but as an adult, it felt a little like cheating in a vanilla run. Plus it wasn't as fun to use it since I just swept through the league as Team Sky a couple months before, so there wasn't any novelty to it. The next playthrough was one that I didn't actually do. Pokemon let's go, but I'm team rocket. This was a playthrough that Grunty Boy did, so I'll let him discuss it. Oh my God, finally, you talk forever. Ugh. Ha ha, it is I, Grunty Boy, here to tell you about the best playthrough on any of the MNG TV channels this year, mine. My team in the league was Grunty Chew the Pikachu, Grunty Bat the Golbat, Grunty Shrew the Sandslash, Grunty Nap the Hypno, Grunty Blue the Alolan Sandslash, Grunty Muck the Alolan Muck, 
and Grunty Chop the Machamp. And yes, there are seven Pokemon here because I used Grunty Chop to battle Lorelei, then swapped it out for Grunty Shrew for the remainder of the league because you can do that in the newer games. But there were also quite a few Pokemon I used throughout my journey that didn't end up on the final team that deserve some recognition. Grunty Ghost the Gengar, Grunty Rat the Raticate, and Grunty Cat the Persian. This team is obviously 10 out of 10. It's proper Team Rocket Grunt Pokemon. Plus the first Pikachu Team Rocket has actually been able to get their hands on and some fun Alola forms of Rocket Grunt species that were very good and very fun to use. And if you don't like that I used Alola forms because Rocket Grunts don't use Alola forms, then you're wrong. If other Grunts use Sand Slash and Muck, then so can I, any form of them. And the team was just so good, never struggled once. Oh God. Incredibly powerful, type diverse, the most creative nicknames of the entire year? This team allowed me to ascend from a simple Team Rocket grunt to the champion of an entire region. The team is 10 out of 10, no arguments, no debates, ta-ta. Well, it's hard to disagree with him. Let's move on. The next playthrough was the return of Team Sky, this time in Pokemon Leaf Green. A video that actually has more views than the original? I don't know how that happened. This was a really fun playthrough. I loved getting into character as the leader of Team Sky, and Kanto has so many fun flying types to choose from. The team I beat the league with was Pseudo Sky the Gyarados, Houdini the Dragonite, Apex the Aerodactyl, Boreas the Articuno, Tyrannus the Zapdos, and Ra the Moltres. However, a lot of these Pokemon joined the team late, so I need to give a nod to the Pokemon that helped along the way, mainly Firework the Charizard, Teamwork the Dodrio, Mach the Pidgeot, and Javelin the Fero. I'm gonna give this team a nine out of 10. Team Sky has probably been my favorite thing to come out of all my content this year, and this playthrough was just as much fun as the first one. Using all three legendary birds together was a really cool thing I've never done before, and I love the mental image of the Team Sky leader wielding them all. Plus, once Houdini finally became a Dragonite, it was incredibly powerful. Pseudo Sky also saved my butt a ton of times all throughout the playthrough. In the first Team Sky video, I didn't use Gyarados because I was like, it's flying type, but it can't actually fly. And then some people were like, we disagree. I was like, okay, I'll use it. And then it was really good. I think the only thing keeping this team from being 10 out of 10 is Apex the Aerodactyl. It joined late and wasn't really impactful, so I didn't really have the chance to get sentimentally attached to it. But overall, I love this team. Go Team Sky! And go! Show me at to buy a Team Sky shirt. <laughs> and also subscribe, I haven't said that yet. The next playthrough was Pokemon Shield, but I randomized everything. And in case any of you were not aware of this, this is my biggest video ever on either channel. While it isn't my most viewed video ever, it's in 12th place compared to videos on this channel as of recording this, it got to that place in just two months. It's my first and only so far video to get 1 million views in less than a week. If it keeps getting the views that it's still getting every day, it will become my most viewed video ever in a year or two. Maybe, if the views keep up. In short, my next YouTube career goal, in addition to getting MNJTV plays to 1 million subs, so you should subscribe to it, is making it so the Shield Randomizer video is not an outlier. But even if the video wasn't a massive hit, it was still really fun. I already enjoyed doing the Extreme Randomizer in white, but doing it in a new game where the random Pokemon are causing chaos in the overworld was amazing. The final team I used in the league was Charge Stone the Electric Rock Tapu Koko, Paradox the Fire Ice Victini, Leviathan the Fairy Flying Lapras, Zero the Poison Fighting Zero Aura, Mutal the Steel Mew, and Terex the Water Archaeops. Four legendaries on the final roster, three of which were gifts from collecting Diglets on the Isle of Armor, and one of which was from an evolution. I'm giving this team an eight out of 10 because if I was ranking these Pokemon individually, they would vary wildly. Leviathan was used very little and never really got great moves. Mutal was good, but not used a whole lot. Zero and Paradox were good and used a decent amount of times, but Charge Stone and Terex were possibly the most broken Pokemon I have ever used. And I'm including full powered legends like Rayquaza. Charge Stone was an electric rock Tapu Koko with clear body, so already a great Pokemon, but then it learned Bolt Beak, 
Dracozolt and Arctozolt's signature move that doubles damage if the user hits first. This is balanced out by Dracozolt and Arctozolt not being super fast, but Tapu Koko is having a base speed stat of 130. This means it had a 100% accurate physical move for its base 115 physical attack that was 170 base power before the stab boost like 99% of the time. It could absolutely destroy most any opponent that was not a ground type. And then I had Terex, a pure water Archeops without defeatist meaning its stats were always on par with a legendary like Tapu Koko. It had the water equivalent of Bolt Beak, Vicious Rend, and while it isn't as fast as Tapu Koko, Archeops is still very fast, plus it hits harder. This meant I had two fast and physically strong Pokemon with stab moves that were 170 base power most of the time. They were virtually unstoppable and did almost all the battling for the later part of the game. They were some of my favorite Pokemon to use ever, especially after all the struggles I had in the early game, and they're all I think about when I think about that team. Which is why I can't give the whole team 10 out of 10. Terex and Charge Stone, they're like 11, 12 out of 10 but they were so good that they outshone the rest of the team, so I can't give the whole team a 10 out of 10. Next was when I played through Pokemon Alpha Sapphire as a grass gym leader. I've always thought a grass gym leader would have fit perfectly in the Hoenn region due to how many really cool grass types there are there, so I decided to become one myself. The team was Evergreen the Mega Sceptile, Imposter the Breloom, Papaya the Ludicolo, Oleander the Rose Raid, Sirius the Cacturn, and Anchor the Cradilly. Plus some help from Gravitrope the Tropius during parts of it. This team is 10 out of 10. Every team member in the final six played a big role and was super helpful at one point or another. And it included my favorite Pokemon, Sceptile. Despite being all grass types, the team kicked butt in the league punctuated with an epic mega versus mega battle where Evergreen came out on top. I love the Hoenn grass types and this team proved how awesome they are. The next playthrough was my first run of Pokemon Brilliant Diamond, played as a vanilla playthrough with no gimmicks, since I will basically never do anything but a regular playthrough for my first playthrough of a brand new game. The final team was Howler the Infernape, Stealth the Gliscor, Hemlock the Rose Raid, Flux the Magnezone, Sorceress the Gardevoir, and Vandal the Weavile. Something about this team that I did not realize until later on in the playthrough was that every member species but Vandal was a Pokemon with a prominent role in my first Nuzlocke of Pokemon Platinum. I think I ended up doing that subconsciously as a way to redeem that very depressing playthrough. I'm giving this team eight out of 10. All the members are cool Pokemon that I like, especially Stealth the Gliscor. I had to get a Razor Fang from a friend due to the poor game design of these remakes, but having it on my team was a lot of fun. And it was actually the Pokemon to win me the lead. What's keeping it from a perfect score though, are two things. The first is that it's extremely weak to Lucian's Bronzong, which I did not realize until I almost lost to it during my first run through of the league. It having a super effective move for five of my 16 members. The only one who was not weak to it was Stealth, who had fainted at the time. Trick Room was up, and if it had gone for Psychic on Howler instead of Earthquake, I would have been screwed. But the other reason I can't give it a perfect score is because it's associated with Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. The main series games that have caused me the most disappointment that I can recall. I discuss all my problems with the games in another video, but to summarize, I don't think the games as a whole are bad. I had fun playing them, but they have a lot of issues that could have easily been remedied to result in a much higher quality end product. Because this team is associated with this disappointing game, it's tough for me to get as attached to it. But overall, I still love the Pokemon themselves, especially Stealth the Gliscor. And the final team of the year was my playthrough in Black 2 as a bug catcher. Bug catchers were in every region until Unova, so I decided to become the first bug catcher in Unova, the region with very strong bug types. The final team was Fashion the Levani, Trebuchet the Heracross, Rockstar the Crustal, Hacker the Galvantula, Beyond the Escavalier, and Saul the Volcarona, plus Autobot the Scolipede earlier in the run. This team I unfortunately have to give three out of 10. It was a real struggle at times. The bug type is simply not very good, and having a team where four of the six members had a four times weakness, one of them having two, got very frustrating. 
I'd be doing fine until a Pokemon tosses out a random fire or flying or rock move, and one of my Pokemon is instantly dead, even if the opponent's move was not a stab move or was not a very powerful move. My starter, Fashion the Levani, was the highlight though, being fun and clutch in several gym battles, but overall the team was frustrating to use. The frustration was amplified since I was trying to beat this playthrough on a deadline. So every random loss that caused me to have to go back to a Pokemon Center and do something again was extra frustrating because it was making it take longer. Additionally, Sol the Volcarona, a Pokemon I expected to carry the team, ended up not being very good not getting a better fire move than Ember until right before the league when I got the flamethrower TM and dying to even the weakest of rock moves. In the end, the main Pokemon I got attached to was Fashion the Levani, but overall, I didn't end up very fond of this team. Now that I've covered them all, I'll rank them, but first I wanna cover all the Pokemon that ended up on more than one final team of six this year. Those would be Breloom, Rayquaza, Crobat, Crocodile, Rose Raid, Weavile, and Cradilly. While the first four are Pokemon I love and have used multiple times in the past, the last three are ones that I hadn't used before and it's a testament to how fun they are to use that I used them more than once. Cradilly was the biggest surprise since it's a Pokemon I've overlooked a lot in the past. All right, now let's rank them. Black 2 as a bug catcher is last with three out of 10, then the white randomizer with four out of 10. Sorry, Unova fans, next time I'll try to use a team that I end up loving. Then we have Ultra Moon no catching and Emerald original team at seven out of 10, and I'm giving the Ultra Moon team the edge here. Then Y Dark Gym Leader, Shield Randomizer, and Brilliant Diamond were eight out of 10, and I'll order them as Brilliant Diamond as the lowest, then Y Dark Gym Leader, then Shield Randomizer as the highest. Then Can You Beat Platinum and Leaf Green Team Sky were both nine out of 10, and I'll give Can You Beat Platinum the edge due to the shinies. Then finally, Emerald Team Sky, Let's Go Team Rocket, and Alpha Sapphire Grass Gym Leader were the tens out of 10 and I'd put them as Team Rocket in third place, Grass Gym Leader in second place, and Emerald Team Sky as first place. Sorry, Grunty Boy. It's fine, you're just an idiot. Which was your favorite team that I used this year? Let me know down in the comments below and thank you so much for watching. With an extra special thanks to my patrons over on Patreon who are helping support my channel independent of fluctuating YouTube ad rates. If you wanna help support me in the same way, the link is in the description below. Also, if you wanna check out some more of my fun Pokemon content, I recommend these videos here. All right, that's all I have for now. So until the next time, begins. Gotta catch them all.